get set up, I'm going to take this moment to introduce her. So um, as we close and reflect on, I think, what's been a really wonderful day of conversations, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our symposium respondent, Anna Miliaki. Um, Anna Miliaki is a critic, curator, and associate professor of architecture at MIT, where she teaches history, theory, and design. She's previously taught studios and seminars at Columbia University, City College in New York, Harvard GSD, and she holds a PhD in history and theory of architecture from Harvard University, an MArc from Rice, and a BA from Bennington College. Her interests range from the role of architecture and architects in the Cold War era Eastern Europe through theories of postmodernism and late socialism to politics of contemporary architectural production. Anna was part of the three-member curatorial team with Eva Frank Gilbert and, Ash and Ashley Schaefer of the U.S. Pavilion at the 2014 Venice Architectural Biennale. Their Biennale project, entitled Office U.S., critically examined the last century of U.S. architectural offices. Anna edited the Proceedings of Under the Influence, a conference she organized at MIT in 2013 on the topic of influence, originality, and copying. On that same topic, she's curated and produced an exhibition on the role of copying and originality in architecture entitled Fair Use with her students at MIT and published The Terms of Appropriation, a collection of historical essays with Amanda Reeser Lawrence. Related to this symposium, Anna's research and writing include significant work on the history and contemporary culture of consumption. Her book, The Optimum Imperative, Czech Architecture for the Socialist Lifestyle, 1938 to 1968, was published in 2017. This work explores socialist lifestyle in post-war Czechoslovakia and is particularly interesting in the relationship to varied, the varied historical and cultural contexts of consumption that we've been discussing um, this weekend from the American suburbs to rubbish theory, stock products, and nightclubs of Barcelona. As we consider circulation in all of its forms, digital, physical, material, and intellectual, we're privileged to have Anna conclude this symposium with her unique insight and intelligence on today's topic. Um, please help me in welcoming Anna Miliaki. Thank you. Thank you so much. So hello, everyone. I know you've been here a long time. It's not a super long uh, thing that I'll try to do. Uh, but it will be slightly more meta and uh, in a way in anticipation of the talks that I saw today. So for the most part, I think I anticipated them correctly. <laughs> so thank you, Ashley, for having me uh, here and giving me the last word too. Uh, I hope that's going to be okay with everyone. I seem to come to Ohio to pontificate uh, and close events. And I do think it's been, an, for me at least, an awesome ride today and yesterday, thanks to my great colleagues who have taken uh, turns on the stage. And so as I make my remarks also, please remember that um, I've been dealing with your work for a lot less time than you have, and I know it in less depth. So uh, take it with a grain of salt, throw it out if it means, you know, if it doesn't work. So. To appear at the end uh, and sum up or respond would indeed be to fulfill my role as it was designated for the event, but also to end an event uh, that is about fulfillment is a tall order, especially given the topics that are now laying splayed in all of their nuance, gore, and color before us, from desire to death, from data to dados. I would have loved to opt for longing uh, following Michelle's performance, but I was not clever or brave enough to hire a stunt actor. And then, you know, I may yet leave you wanting more, for better or for worse. Um, the presentations over the last two days, from Keith's countryside to Christina's instructions for desire, have painted in the most haunting and at times delightful ways the Capitello scene that we all inhabit marked by more and less cognitive dissonance about the local and global logistics we participate in, and whose logics might govern not only their fulfillment, but our own individual and collective sense of it as well. I am most interested in what Ashley, uh, in the blurb for our event, described as sticky, sometimes improvised against the grain, hard to compute, even as it leaves data in its wake. If you know me, you can imagine that I have been tracking my little personal fulfillment meter uh, as the last two days of presentations unfolded. 
Now, I wouldn't want to propose that my own moments of jouissance ought to be relevant to anyone but myself, though how much of a self can I or anyone claim to be in the world you all assembled for us to contemplate? This seems a key question to repeat now and maybe to keep repeating out of this symposium. But there is a certain kind of constancy to these you know, excitements I tracked uh, that might be worth uh, exploring. I got interested in the way each of the presentations and bodies of work they advocated for crossed and minded the gap between a kind of automatism of expectations and their fulfillment on one side and unpredictability on the other. From Curtis's hauntingly beautiful algorithmic paintings, and this, these drawings precede the paintings he showed, through Leda's estranged and vibrant of the shelf, to the urgency of Christina's difficult synth complexes through Mira's layered textile, Ang's styrofoam, Leah's pleasure boxes, to Ashley's world stitching bottom up market weaves. It is super optimistic, it seems to me, to assess unflinchingly or without airbrushing much the contemporary ways of the Capitello scene and crack it open as you have, each in a slightly different way, to find unexpected territories for aesthetic expression and architectural projects that seem appropriate to it. Architecture that inhabits the post-orthographic, the post-net, the post-natural, the global, statistical, contemporary, political, and cultural moment. So with the aftertaste of that latent and sometimes um, even uncomfortable optimism, I have a few comments uh, in response. The first one has to do with the posture of the work or of the entire symposium really, or what I think is the balance that these last two days have managed to strike between a kind of realism and idealism. And I mean those colloquially, but also uh, technically, philosophically. I believe that this, for me now, palpable balance is a real feat. It has been harder and harder to conjure any form of idealism or optimism lately, at least on the East Coast, and if you're approaching 50. Just a cursory scan uh, across the news titles is enough to send one down a dark and lonely spiral. But all of you seems to look down that spiral, take its measure, and adjust course forward. This is what Bruno Latour advocated for in his Compositionist Manifesto a few years ago. In that essay and lecture, he repainted the picture of Paul Klee's Angelus Novus, or of Walter Benjamin's painting of Paul Klee's Angelus Novus. The angel of history who looks backward and in terror produced by what he sees, he flees forward, breaking havoc in his wake, seeing that havoc and fleeing forward from it with his back turned on the direction he's moving and so forth. Latour proposed that in response to this modernist figure and modernist conception of progress, we might need to imagine ourselves differently oriented, looking forward with a kind of perspective gaze and with an eye on our collective prospects, which we might end up shaping if we are lucky, organized, or ingenious, or more likely all of the above. The perspective look is the only type of view that might ensure our future prospects, but it might also be a symptom of our contemporary rewriting of the linear logic of historical imagination. And I wouldn't go so far as John May has recently gone to call it a loss of historical thinking, which he suggests accompanies the post-orthographic statistical habits of thought and work, but it is certainly a rearrangement and complication of that historical thinking. I would like to also try another characterization of this perspective view insofar as one can speak generally about the presentations today and, and the work that they stand for as a particularly contemporary flavor of ambivalent. Now, I know I've offered just a moment ago to see it as optimistic, but I think it's useful to complicate it a bit via Timothy Morton's hyper objects, for example, and this is an image done by a photographer that Morton relies on not showing the hyperobject because we cannot see it, right? When talking about hyperobjects of which climate crisis or global warming is Morton's key example, because hyperobjects are so complex, so far beyond the scale of any single human life that they are hard to comprehend and even harder to see, he describes a form of irony that is not the plastic postmodern type, but rather the kind of irony conjured up in the presence of hyperobjects. 
romantic irony. And, and by this, he really is referring to uh, Schlegel, Fichte, Novalis, which you don't have to know, but the German romantics who thought about irony uh, in a particular moment. But he is talking about it as now structural to the experience of reality, a paradoxically sincere irony, a kind of coupling of self-awareness with the realization that there is no distance to be had. Since irony, in the presence of hyperobjects, like a global warming, is like, quote, being Jonah in the whale, realizing that he is part of the whale's digestive system. Or Han Solo and Leia inside a gigantic worm they think is the surface of an asteroid. Now, I hope you see, or might even agree, that any individuals, in the old sense of that term, or any individual researcher and producer's action in relation to our contemporary capitalocene's hyperobjects, which might be statisticization of self, global material and labor, labor networks, global warming, and the finance logistical complexes, simply requires and relies on this form of romantic irony, in which the narrator realizes that she is part of the story and that there is no meta-language beyond it. The very fact of becoming aware of the hyperobjects and acting in their midst produces the effect of irony. That a Gen Xer in me has been rejoicing about uh, when recognizing it in my students and colleagues' work without necessarily fully understanding it or uh, being pushed to figure it out until you ask me to respond here. Morton offers that, quote, strangely, irony has not gone anywhere, but has increased in potency and poignancy. Irony has lost its postmodern edge. It is its t-shirt sloganeering. Irony has become the feeling of waking up inside a hyperobject against which we are always in the wrong. To get back to the question or hope for stickiness that I alluded to earlier, there used to be a time when a concept like running room for culture or criticality made sense. In an analog world, distinctions could be made between urns and chambers, between the utilitarian and the cultural, perhaps between us and them. If you're a student now, and there are maybe still a few in the room, um, you might remember hearing about a uh, running room and might have at least a lingering cultural memory of it, but not a lived one necessarily. Hal Foster celebrated it not long ago, but it was, a, it was put forward in German as Spielraum by a satirist poet poet and publisher Karl Kraus in order to describe a space in which cultural action could take place, a space produced by distinction between high and low culture, between art and commerce, where various forms of creative imagination could play out with relative autonomy and from which their products could affect other dimensions of culture and life. It may be a space or a concept, like many others, that we can now see as not only no longer available in the same way, but also as having only ever been a mental construct. From within the belly of hyperobjects, running room will at best seem like a quaint idea, maybe best replaced by stickiness or friction, while aesthetic and political agency could only be fragmentary, experimental, desiring, and self-aware, which is not bad, though indeed fulfillment of the logistical and automatic type might be both continuous and total, and thus still leave us inside its belly. And I'm using your image, Juiz, because I like it, <laughs> as, a, as a description of, I don't know, a hyperobject of sorts. Now, do you want a chapter two? Are we ready? For it's only five minutes, so it's going to be seriously done soon. So chapter two of my response is a bit of a U-turn on the previous conclusion of doing pretty good with our fragmentary action. It pauses on the symposium question, what does it mean to be fulfilled, but not within the logics of logistical, material, or cultural spheres? I would like to ask instead, could political commitment also offer a form of fulfillment, as well as belonging, and how might this in turn change our odds against the hyperobjects in whose bellies we recognize ourselves to be? 
And in this way, perhaps, I follow Keith's more earnest ending yesterday, but it is also a follow-up to some of my own long-term interest in authorship, originality, and individuality, on which a number of projects today dwelt as well, plus a good dose of cheering on the collective. It may also be a nudge away from the tactical towards strategic or collective in a way that this work resists at the moment, and certainly Mira has been saying, let me be tactical right now. But to go there, I follow the cue from a political theorist, Jody Dean, who has been theorizing the logics of circulatory capitalism, as well as of crowds and the organizational structures on the left, the party, and her specifically, she specifically looks at the Communist Party. She recently offered a term that I find super useful in thinking about our historical moment and also my own curatorial activities within it. She offered communicative capitalism to further specify the contemporary effects of that circulatory capitalism. Under communicative capitalism, everyone and everything contributes to the constantly streaming flow of data and voices. Its chief characteristic is the fundamental separation of politics that circulate as content and politics as policy or as real transformation. As messages are generated and consumed at greater and greater velocity, their exchange value eclipses their use value, and they increasingly contribute only to their own flow, shifting thus the experience of activism from actually engaged and transformative acts to a vague sense of contribution to that stream of commentary. In order to begin to assemble radical imagination in this context, and that might be one way to describe what is necessary in the contemporary moment, mutual interests or even shared concerns might not be enough. Dean offers comradeship over alliance or friendship as a unique social and political bond and the only one capable of standing up to communicative capitalism with agendas external to it and in order to affect outcomes that might oppose it. Sharing concerns, logistics, material, desire, climate crisis, human migration, fires, or aesthetic alignment indeed brings us closer to comradeship, but it does not ensure it. In Dean's thesis, the comrade is a figure of belonging with a mode of address and an anticipation of action. This is a kind of belonging I like to think of as after belonging. The bond between comrades is not transactional. It is neither an exchange nor love or friendship. Comrades stand together focused on their shared political goal rather than on their legitimate and real differences or correspondences. That political goal, which is for Dean a complete transformation of the capitalist scene or capitalism into a more just and equitable system, precedes and structures the social bond among comrades. It survives gossip and infractions of various kinds. Now, I love the work that I saw today. It is urgent and transformative and delightful. But here is what I ask myself and would like to ask you. Would it be possible and how would it change your work and forms of agency to place and articulate political go goals outside of the work such that this kind of gathering, <coughs> ours today, sorry, becomes a gathering of comrades set on transforming the discipline and the world together as opposed to one awesome project at a time? In other words, can you imagine in, in direct disregard for university politics, tenure and promotion systems, and beyond those, the lo logics of communicative capitalism, can we imagine producing a program of action together that might <coughs> bind us, bind you, us, to transformative goals beyond our own personal projects? That's all I have. 